In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In today's Gospel passage, we see a very sad and tragic scene. Jesus Christ and his apostles are approaching the city of Nain, and they see that the entire city is outside of the gates in the middle of a funeral procession. At the front of that procession is a woman who is literally losing her mind. If you look at the icon in your weekly bulletin of this miracle, you'll see that she is literally pulling her hair out. She is in such agony. She is in such pain. And it is revealed to us that the funeral is for her son, her only child. And further, she herself is a widow. She now has nobody. She is all alone in this world. And the entire town has come together to bid farewell to her son, this young man. They pity her, but at the end of the day, they have no obligation to her. And because they have no obligation to her, what will happen to her is what happens to so many. People will be around for a few days, few weeks, few months, but gradually everyone is going to abandon her, and this woman will be all alone with her pain, with her agony, and she is terrified. She is broken. And Jesus Christ, when he sees this, the gospel passage tells us that he has esplachnia. Esplachnia in Greek is translated to compassion, but to better understand this term, we have to take the word and break it apart. Ev means good, something that is good. Splachna, well, quite literally translates to guts. When you have anxiety, when you are worried about something, typically what do we have in our stomach? Butterflies, as they say. We're worried. We have anxiety. This woman that's losing her mind is full of anxiety. She's grieving her son. She's worried about her future. But Jesus Christ tells her, don't weep. Don't cry. And then he touches the funeral buyer. Now for us that don't know Jewish customs, we think, okay, he touched the buyer, so what? But those that were carrying the buyer froze up. They were shocked. They are shocked because in Jewish funerary rites, you can't really touch the body. People that are, the people that do the funeral processions for the Jewish people, they have to do a rite of purification for themselves. They have to dress and prepare the body through a sheet so that they're not directly touching the dead. Because touching the dead is defilement. It makes you unclean. And so when Jesus Christ touches the funeral buyer, literally the symbol of death, they panic. They recoil. Because now Jesus Christ has made himself unclean. Now Jesus Christ has been defiled. But Jesus Christ shows us who and what he is when he tells the young man, rise up. And he sat up on the funeral buyer. Everyone is in shock, but Jesus Christ helps unwrap him, takes his hand, and presents him to his mother. Now, this is to show us something that Jesus Christ, who will himself rise from the dead, is Lord of life and death. Death cannot de have dominion over him. Death cannot defile him. He who goes into death itself obliterates death. He shows in this moment that he is our God. And he shows mercy on this woman. Now, we could look at this and think to ourselves that, well, how nice for her. 
There are thousands, millions of widows that lose their children. We all look at the tragedies that have just happened over the last few days to know that tragedy is everywhere. But why did Jesus Christ have compassion on this woman? The short answer is, I don't know, and neither do you. But the long answer is more nuanced. Jesus Christ, our God, knows what we can and what we cannot handle. Things that will break us and things that will allow us to flourish. There is, of course, a story relating to Malachi 3.3. Malachi 3.3 is the Lord shall be compared to a purifier of silver. Perhaps you've heard this story before. There was a group of women who wanted to know what this meant. And so they went to a purifier of silver, a silversmith, and asked him, what does it mean to purify silver? And he said, well, you have to understand, silver, when it comes out of the mountains, is in a lodestone. It's not by itself. It's with many other minerals, many other metals. So it's not pure, not yet. And so the women asked, so you chisel it away? Do you just cut it off? He said, no. Silver is delicate. Silver can be destroyed easily. The only way to separate the silver from the others is to put it in fire, to burn off the other elements. And they said, okay, so how long do you leave it in the fire? Well, that's the problem. You can't know because of how many other minerals might be in there. And silver is so delicate that if you leave it in the fire even a little bit too long, it will be destroyed. Okay, so you put it in and then you come back a couple of days? No. Silver is so delicate, you have to keep an eye on it constantly. And they said, okay, so you do this from a far distance? He said, no. You have to be in the fire. There's a special suit that you wear so that you're in the fire with the silver. You're literally putting it in the flame, out of the flame. In the flame, out of the flame. In the flame, out of the flame. And throughout the process, the impurities keep dripping off, dripping off, dripping off, until finally you're left with a pure nugget of silver. The ladies asked him, how do we know it's done? He said, that's the easy part. When I can see my face in it, I know that it's ready. We go through sufferings and struggles daily, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, but we would not be able to do it without the help of Christ. Now, I learned something yesterday, something about icons, and I didn't think it was possible for me to learn anything new about iconography. But in this miracle and in this allegory about God, we see God is mighty. We see that God is Lord over life and death. And it'd be very easy for us to think of God in the ways that the statues of ancient gods in Egypt and Rome and Greece looked. And in them, the eyes are always looking down. The pupils are always depicted looking down because we humans were beneath them. We're less than them. And so they almost have a look of like scowling at us. And so these statues look down upon you. But when you look at an icon, even in the icon of the Pantocrator, the pupils are always on top. Because what is it showing? God is looking up at you. He's not looking down at you. He's looking up at you. He's humbling himself. In the same way that a mother looks to their child, the child always sees the mother's eyes looking up, never looking down at the child. This shows God's manifold love and humility. He did not see himself above this woman and her suffering. He did not see her as an ant to say, okay, I'm just going to throw her a little bit of grace to make her happy. This is a God who sees our pain intimately, who loves us dearly as a parent, and suffers with us in our fire. He is not absent from it, 
He is with us, like he was with the three Hebrew children in the flames of Babylon, which we commemorate every Holy Saturday. So yes, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, this miracle that takes place today on the third Sunday of Luke, in which Christ raises the widow's son in Nain, is important because it teaches us that Jesus Christ is Lord of life and death. But more than that, it shows us his immeasurable love, his immeasurable love for us in everything that he does for us. I pray that all of us can experience that and understand that. And when we look upon the icons in our home, notice that they look up at us because they're not above us, but love us. In the name of the Father. Amen.